tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The guy cut in front of him and thrust a pole with sufficient force to go all the way through his skull and into his brain. The father of a teen skier hurt on Grouse Mountain appeals for witnesses to come forward also. Police say this man could be a key witness in a crash that left a 13-year-old Coquitlam girl dead. And... It only makes sense that for the new Coast Guard fleet, we're turning to workers here in Vancouver. Spending billions to shore up a rusting fleet. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Was it a case of rage or just a mistake? There's a call for witnesses tonight after some sort of conflict with two skiers on Grouse Mountain. It left a young boy with a traumatic brain injury. The CBC's Tina Lovegreen is live at Grouse Mountain tonight. Tina, take us through what happened there. Well, Mike Anita, 13-year-old Max Keir was skiing on this mountain with his friend on March 30th. He says he was coming down the hill when he had to swerve to, to avoid hitting another skier. Now, he says that skier then hit him with his ski pole, causing a three-centimeter deep puncture in his skull. Now, police don't know if it was intentional or not, but the damages have been devastating for Max's family, who are searching for answers. And the CT scan revealed a bullet-sized hole in his skull. David Keir's 13-year-old son spent four days in the intensive care unit. So I saw the hole in his skull, and I saw the pool of blood in his brain. You freak out as a parent. Max had saved up to buy a pass for spring break. When the incident happened, he was coming down the cut, a green ski run without a helmet. As Max describes it, he was skiing, some other guy was skiing, they came together briefly. Max thought he was skiing erratically. He skied left. Next thing he knows, this guy was in front of him. And in Max's own words, he threw his pole at me. He didn't know he was injured until he got down the hill. At that point, the person who allegedly threw the pole was nowhere to be seen. Max now has a traumatic brain injury and cognitive challenges that only allow him to go to school an hour or two a day. So sure, as a parent, you're, you're seeking justice? Absolutely you are. Almost three weeks after the incident, police did ask for the public's help, but released few details and got few tips. We try never to lose hope, but we're also realistic about not only the time delay, but, but also the, um, the nature of this incident. They're hoping this new information will jog people's memory. We do hope that there is some video evidence still out there for, from people who may have had GoPro cameras on their helmets. I know a lot of people do that, or from their um, mobile phones. And as for Max, his dad says it will be at least nine months until he can go back to playing sports, something the avid baseball player is looking forward to. Now, the man police are looking for was wearing a yellow ski jacket, and that's the only description they have of him. They're also looking to speak to a woman who helped Max with his injuries once he made it down the hill. And also, I should mention again that investigators are not saying whether this was intentional or not, and they won't say so until they get more information. Mike, Anita? Tina Lovegreen live at Grouse Mountain. Tina, thank you. A woman has been injured after she says she was pushed off a cliff and into a lake on the weekend. And now police are looking for witnesses. The 29-year-old claims that while hiking Sunday afternoon above Thetis Lake near Victoria, she came across a group of women who were drinking and that when she looked down at the water, someone shoved her over the edge of the 40-foot drop. It's quite unbelievable what happened to this lady. I've lived here for 30 years. I've never seen anybody actually patrolling the trails. Do you think that needs to change? Um, yeah. Anyone with information is asked to contact West Shore RCMP. Well, there's a man who may be a key witness in a Coquitlam crash that killed a 13-year-old girl. Happened in late March, but police are now releasing video hoping to identify him. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, who are police looking for? He was driving a white SUV and stopped at Mariner Way and Riverside Crescent when that crash happened on March 25th, just before 3 p.m., Young student Deborah Seal was killed that day. Take a look at this short video that police have released. Now, you can see the white SUV circled on the lower left there. Police think it's a Toyota RAV4 from 2016 to 2018. A man gets out, 
He's blocked briefly by that other man by at the scene. Let's zoom in a little bit closer here. Once again, man gets out, and then eventually, once this other man passes through, it appears he picks something up on the road. Now, police want to speak with this man as they piece together that terrible scene from late March. Police say a gray Dodge Charger collided with a black BMW. That BMW's car spun out onto a traffic island, hitting several teens and children. 13-year-old Deborah Seal was killed, and a 6-year-old boy was seriously hurt. The potential witness is said to be an Asian man with a slim build. He was wearing glasses, clean-shaven, with short black hair. He was also wearing a dark top, blue jeans, and white socks with dark shoes. Police want to know if he saw anything that can help them with their investigation. And it's a big one. Remember, police recently reenacted the crash at Mariner Way and Riverside Crescent, closing that busy intersection for hours and driving cars through it to try to get more information about what happened. Again, Coquitlam RCMP are asking that man driving the white SUV. He sees the video near the crash to please contact them. He's not considered a suspect in this at all. They just want to talk to him. And if anybody recognizes him, you're asked to call police as well. Anita, Mike? Dan Burrett, live for us tonight. Thank you. Well, the ship came in today for Vancouver's shipbuilding industry. The federal government announced it is renewing the aging fleet of the Canadian Coast Guard. As Leanne Young reports, it has BC's shipbuilding industry breathing a sigh of relief. At C-SPAN's North Vancouver shipyard, workers are putting the final touches on a Coast Guard research vessel. It's one of three vessels the shipbuilder was given a contract for. And until today, this was going to be it no other major projects once these were complete. Our government will be doing a full renewal of the Canadian Coast Guard fleet and creating new shipbuilding jobs right here in British Columbia. Trudeau's announcement comes with the promise of cash and lots of it. $15.7 billion for 18 new Coast Guard ships, 16 of them to be built right here in Vancouver. And it is breathing new life into the shipbuilding industry. Uh, we've never seen anything as big as this. McPherson has been lobbying for BC's shipbuilders for more than three decades. Today's news means job security for thousands of workers. It's going to be ship after ship after ship, so uh, they can do their planning, they can buy their vehicles, buy their homes. Uh, they, they know they've got a great future ahead of them. Under the National Shipbuilding Strategy, there are two designated shipyards, one in Halifax and one in Vancouver. And while today the industry here is largely celebrating, there was something in the announcement that caught them off guard, the potential opening of a third shipyard somewhere else across the country. Uh, we were disappointed to learn that today because of the investments that we've made out here and the expectations that we've had from the earliest days of the National Shipbuilding Strategy that this was about two shipyards. A third shipyard means more competition and that could affect the 1,200 employees here. Page is hoping to sit down with the Trudeau government soon to figure out the implications and keep as much of the work here as possible. Until then... It's good news for our workforce, it's good news for the apprentices that we have on board here and in Victoria and for the interns that we've taken on as we accept the responsibility to train the next generation of shipbuilders. Now work in this yard is expected to continue for years to come. Leanne Young, CBC News, North Vancouver. Well, the Prime Minister's next stop, a Liberal fundraiser. And Trudeau was cut off in the middle of a speech by a protester. Take a look. We need to move forward in a thoughtful, true partnership know, way on reconciliation. Uh, Hello, like, climate leaders don't build pipelines. Thank you. You threatened our lands and waters. Uh, right? I have How heard, dare you bring that I have heard our waters? some fellow leaders of yours. Highways. You have, have no heard, right to do that to us. Sir, I have heard from some of your fellow indigenous here. leaders. I've heard from some of your fellow indigenous leaders who are in favor of resource development. The B.C. Court of Appeal is expected to deliver its decision on this province's legal challenge of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion on Friday. Canada is spending more than a million dollars to bring dozens of containers of rotting garbage back here from the Philippines. And while there's no word yet on where it'll end up, Vancouver was at one point set to be involved. Earlier this month, Ottawa offered to ship the garbage to Vancouver before it was disposed of, but that deal with the Philippines fell through. Now the federal government now says the trash will be picked up by the end of June and disposed of by the end of the summer. But how and where that will actually happen isn't clear. The garbage was wrongly sent to the Philippines by a Canadian company six years ago.
A lawsuit filed in B.C. Supreme Court is alleging ties between a B.C. man and Australia's biggest ever drug bust. B.C.'s director of civil forfeiture wants to keep more than $3 million that police allegedly found in Rolando Gallardo's home. And as Jason Proctor reports, the lawsuit says there's no way the retiree should have that kind of money. Police in California intercepted this load of stereo equipment last February before it could reach its final destination in Australia. They found more than just speakers in the shipping containers, seizing more than $1.2 billion worth of methamphetamine and cocaine that was hidden in amplifiers, a record amount for drugs heading down under. At the same time as that was happening, RCMP were raiding a home in this Burnaby neighborhood, the home of a B.C. man allegedly linked to the Australian operation. In a B.C. Supreme Court civil lawsuit, the director of civil forfeiture claims that Australian border police found a picture of a block of a substance that appeared to be cocaine on Rolando Guajardo's cell phone when he tried to leave the country in June 2018. They allegedly traced the metadata back to this townhome unit. The lawsuit claims Guajardo was also observed in California loading up those very shipping containers along with one of six people who are now in custody in Melbourne. According to the civil claim, RCMP raided one of the units in this townhouse complex back in February and found $3.2 million in tightly bundled wads of cash in bags and boxes under the beds. This, according to the claim, is subsidized housing intended for low-income families. Guajardo is not facing any criminal charges in association with the drug bust. According to the lawsuit, he's 69 years old and claims to be retired. But the civil forfeiture claim says his residence in subsidized housing is not in keeping with his ability to travel to Australia and California on a regular basis, his ability to make multiple deposits of more than $10,000 in the bank, or the over $3 million in cash located throughout the residence. The director of civil forfeiture now wants to keep the money police allegedly found when they raided Guajardo's home. The townhouse complex is run by the Metro Vancouver Housing Corporation. They wouldn't speak about the case for privacy reasons, but insisted they have strict criteria for tenants, including a required legitimate proof of income. None of the claims have been proven in court. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Burnaby. Anti-pipeline activists claim Burnaby Mountain isn't ready for a potential fire at Kinder Morgan's facilities. Now the city of Burnaby says it's reviewing fire safety in the city. The anti-pipeline group claimed it can take fire vehicles 15 to 20 minutes to get to Burnaby Mountain and that the community needs more escape roads along with an improved evacuation plan. Currently have the um, uh, public safety review and um, fire services review underway. This process includes um, interviews with um, stakeholder groups and surveys that people can write in and talk about their concerns. And it will provide strategic direction and recommendation to council to enact on them. Burnaby Council will hear more concerns from the community at a town hall tonight. RCMP and North Vancouver are warning parents tonight about a man who exposed himself to a 13-year-old girl. It happened on May 15th, around 3.40 in the afternoon. The man was driving a silver SUV in the 200 block of 27th Avenue West. Police say he called the girl over to ask for directions and then made a lewd comment and exposed his genitals. Police say the man is white, between 40 to 50 years old. He has a slight ac uh, accent, but the origin is not known. He is balding with brown hair on the sides and has a double chin. The man was wearing black sunglasses and a blue and white zippered sweater. Police say the incident is similar to others reported on the North Shore last year, but they are treating them as separate cases. Well, a by-election is underway in a place in the Lower Mainland with no local government. You'd be forgiven if that doesn't make much sense, but 15,000 people living in and around UBC are choosing someone to sit on Metro Vancouver's board and the TransLink Mayor's Council. And as Justin McElroy reports tonight, they won't be electing a mayor in Electoral Area A. When you're in the city of Vancouver, Politics is pretty simple. 
You have a mayor, council, and elections. But when you cross over into Blanca Street, you're suddenly in Electoral Area A, probably the weirdest political structure in all of British Columbia. There are five people running to be Electoral Area A's regional director, representing all areas in Metro Van without a local government. But even they struggle to explain to friends what they're running for. Generally, it's uh, what is that, and then I have to explain to them what it is. Um, and I think it's more, it's more about, oh, I had no idea. Madison Moore is the daughter of Greg Moore, the former longtime chair of Metro Vancouver. She's excited by the infrastructure and big picture work of regional government, but knows getting the public to care is a battle. It's definitely one of the most unique places I've ever sort of come in contact with because it's not like all connected. There's no one like municipality that's all connected. It's, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. 98% of electoral area eight residents live in the area between the city of Vancouver and Georgia Strait. But those lands are overseen by different groups with different levels of provincial oversight. And the biggest is UBC, which got the province a decade ago to remove it from regional land use oversight. These lands are owned by the university, zoned by the university, and developed by the university. But if local residents want to change things, their options are limited. We don't have city council meetings where people can show up and voice all of their concerns at once. What we have is all sorts of different councils and university bodies governing this area, and it's very hard to know what to do. Candidate Elizabeth Garvey wants to be an advocate for the area's disparate groups, but she also says the province should begin a bigger governance review. It's the largest I'm pretty sure population in BC without any formal municipal government and we can be doing a better job. But the province and UBC have shown no interest in that sort of discussion. So even though whomever is elected here will have a big say in transit and land use discussions across the region, their power beyond the gates at Blanca is limited. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. And just a reminder, you can also watch uh, CBC Vancouver News at 6 on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And if you're watching us right now at Facebook or YouTube, we are also live during the upcoming commercial break. Our crews battling wildfires in Alberta are getting help from hundreds of new firefighters. Coming up, as more residents are forced from their homes, BC crews are on the way. Hello to you if you are watching online. We are back live during the break. Yeah, springtime is gardening season for, of course, a lot of Canadians. And this year, along with flowers and herbs, it's entirely legal to plant cannabis in your garden. Yeah, Diane Buckner reports on yet another new sector of Canada's blossoming cannabis economy. Hazelnuts, currants, raspberries, plum, a little medicinal herbary over there. Matt Saltis is a botany student, a father of two, and a first-time grower of recreational cannabis. I was mixing in compost we make from our, all our kitchen scraps. He started these plants indoors in February. Now that it's warm enough, he's ready to transplant them into his backyard garden. And it could easily get like six feet tall, six feet wide. Really? Uh, it could easily get that big. Nothing on here is labeled cannabis. All these products work for all types of plants. Alex Ray is seeing new faces at his gardening store, which specializes in supplies for homegrown cannabis. For the price conscious consumer, if you're paying around $10 a gram or more um, for the varieties at the store, you might be only paying 50 cents a gram or less for a variety that you grow yourself at home. Even Scott's miracle Grow, a well-known brand of fertilizer, has a cannabis division, Hawthorne Gardening. It's been focused on hydroponics, but the company sees new opportunity. We love the way that the laws in Canada come down. A lot of research and development folks have a lot of exciting things um, in there, what we call our innovation pipeline. Um, a lot of those are focused on outdoor growing as we see that continue to emerge. But many provinces have seen supply problems with the processed product, and now there's a shortage of seeds as well. These are Tweed Baker Street seeds. This retail chain has a limited supply of just one variety. Four seeds cost $60. Legalization is new. October 17th was just a few months ago. So uh, we know that our selection of seeds will absolutely grow. Matt Saltis has what he needs for a good harvest in the fall. He has just one worry, theft. I kind of advise people to plant it 
uh, with visibility from neighbors in mind. So obscured by fences or other bushes. Cannabis aficionados may be convinced homegrown weed is worth the trouble, no matter the pitfalls. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Guelph. A growing industry indeed. It's kind of like a, all these gr grow ups, legal grow ups. Legal grow ups in your backyard. Why not? Yeah. I guess if. Wow, big business for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's it for our Facebook Live and YouTube, all that jazz during yeah. the commercial break. We'll be back shortly with the rest of your news. Time to get the class. We sent a CBC Vancouver journalist to a Surrey High School for one month to see what life is like for teenagers today. Don't miss Matheson, a CBC Vancouver special series from May 21st until the 31st. The risk from wildfires remains extreme in northern Alberta, with the largest fire now covering more than 900 square kilometers. Today, our Rafi Bujikanian got a first look inside High Level, a town that is sitting vacant after flames forced residents to leave. The flames threatening High Level may be at bay for now, but firefighters are taking precautions. Setting up protective measures in what's normally a bustling community, now a ghost town. The danger has not passed, nor has it diminished. Not the update residents hoped for. I'm pleading with everyone to be patient and that the evacuation of high level will continue into the foreseeable future. This is how close the flames got before winds pushed them away. A nearby mill, one of the town's main employers, barely escaped damage. Albertans know well the devastation of wildfires. Fort McMurray is still recovering from the damage it suffered three years ago. Josh Knelson went there as a firefighter. Now his community has had to flee. Fort McMurray, they got very lucky. Right? I mean, nobody got hurt there and it was amazing. I mean, the fire is very close. I mean, it's, it's a matter of a wind shift and it's a whole different story right and we'd have a totally different interview right now one sliver of good news utility workers have managed to restore most of the town's power just a matter of waiting right now until air quality and everything else harold hines left in such a hurry on monday he had no time to tell loved ones he's okay i haven't talked to my family yet but uh i'm sure it's on national tv but if you are there, if you hear me, I'm, I'm all fine. Oh, we had to get evacuated. Today, he left his brother an emotional voicemail. Uh, Everything's fine, so don't worry about it. Just tell everybody I'm fine. It's a hell of an experience, I'll tell you that, sir. He's looking forward to telling them the danger has passed. Rafi Mujikan, CBC News, High Level, Alberta. And many evacuees from High Level traveled south more than 500 kilometers to reach Slave Lake, a community that knows all too well the dangers of wildfire. Some 400 homes were destroyed back in 2011 when flames swept through the town. Aaron Collins was there as the high-level exiles filled up local hotels and campgrounds. In Slave Lake, people understand the road evacuees have traveled to get here better than most. It was, it was terrifying. It was a very traumatic experience for us, but um, we have moved on from it. Just eight years ago, a fire chased Edie Clausen from her home. Yeah, that threat is never far from her mind. It can take a town. It's taken how many towns in the last uh, two, Fort Mac and us. So, um, you know, you're just more aware how dangerous it is. Wayne Spracklin was setting up camp after a harrowing drive from high level. But when you look behind you and you're going, oh, this is like Armageddon. No sooner had he settled in, he was greeted by another fire. And then the lake was overcome by water bombers and uh, chemical planes and helicopters and it was like chaos all over again. It was quickly put out by water bombers already on hand dealing with yet another fire nearby. A close call and a reminder that at this time of year the threat from fires is constant here. Northern Alberta now is in a what I would consider to be a drought. 
very dry, no rains, had some lightning, and it doesn't, it's not going to take much for another one to spark up, right? Back at the camp office, Clausen has advice for her guests. Be patient, um, be prepared. It could be days, it could be weeks before they let you back, and uh, it's in their best interest. To wait. To wait. And they may need to. Firefighters in the air over Alberta have a steep challenge ahead. The forecast is for more hot, dry weather in the days to come. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Slave Lake, Alberta. Brett Soderholm is here now, and he's been tracking the wildfire situation in Alberta. Brett, what is the latest? Yeah, well, as we heard in that hit, uh, basically there's no rain in the forecast, and unfortunately for right now, the story is going to be all about the winds. What you're looking at behind me is a wind map that I've put together to show you in relation to where the fire is indicated by this little orange logo here, and this arrow here. This is pointing the direction that the wind is going to be traveling. So when you're seeing it point to the left here, that means the winds are coming from the east and blowing to the west. Now, this is good news. The town is to the north and east of the fire, so all of that smoke is actually going into the BC Peace region and staying away from the town. But I want to show you what's going to be happening over the next few days, keeping in mind that, first of all, this wind forecast is actually a very difficult thing to pinpoint. Friday specifically is a big concerning day. We see values here up to around 45. That means winds could be gusting up to 45 kilometers per hour, though again, blowing from the north and taking it away from the town. But as the weekend progresses, what I'm mostly concerned about is actually going to be on Sunday. Watch this arrow. It's now pointing up. That means the winds are going to be coming from the south and the southwest at 40 kilometers per hour. That means all of that smoke could actually be making its way back into the community. So that's definitely going to be something to be watching. In addition to that, there is no real rainfall in the forecast. Everything is going to be to the south of the city. So this is not good. Conditions are expected to be quite dry. And in addition to that, you're going to be noticing that the skies are actually quite hazy. I've put haze in the icon here because you can't really see that much of the sun. In addition to that, temperatures are still going to be well above seasonal and all of this combines to be the fact that we have a special air quality statement in effect for not only high level in the surrounding region but actually for the BC piece and into Watson Lake the Yukon and this is all because that smoke is actually blowing directly into that region so even though it is a predominantly Alberta issue right now there are other parts of the country that are going to be feeling similar effects to it. Wow so widespread. Yeah. It really is. Often happens, yeah, even when we have them here. and Exactly. Yeah. And just those dry conditions, this is a transition season, as we know. So, unfortunately, this is certainly above normal in terms of uh, the coverage, but still pretty difficult. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And, you know, as we head into the wildfire season, you're going to hear a lot of words about wildfires. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've heard me mention things already, like hectares, what it means to be contained, and even an interface fire. So what do all those words mean? Well, here's a refresher on the language of wildfires. A 500 hectare wildfire is 10% contained, human caused, and is an interface fire. What does that all mean? Here's a breakdown of some important fire terminology. A wildfire occurs in wilderness areas, away from people and structures. Whereas an interface fire is more of a concern for people. It means a fire could potentially affect man-made structures while at the same time burning natural fuels such as trees and shrubs. In this situation, a house fire could jump to the forest or vice versa. The size of a fire is measured in hectares. One square kilometer is equal to 100 hectares, so a 2,000 hectare fire is 20 square kilometers. Most sports fields are about a hectare in size, so imagine 2,000 football fields on fire. A fire is considered contained when a fuel-free perimeter has been established around it. If a fire is 20% contained, that means 20% of a perimeter has been established. It doesn't necessarily mean the fire is under control. A fire is out of control when it's not responding to suppression efforts or if it's grown after initial suppression efforts. A fire is being held when it is contained but there are still hot spots to extinguish. An escaped fire has breached an established control line and remains out of control. If a fire threatens people or property, authorities might put out an evacuation alert. That signals to residents they need to be ready to leave on short notice. Anyone who leaves during this stage does so voluntarily. Under an evacuation order, however, people must leave the area immediately. This will be enforced by police and officials. During an evacuation order, registering all members of your family at a local reception center tells emergency responders that you're safe. 
Trudeau government spending billions to shore up a rusting fleet. What it all means coming up. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mung, what do you have to say to the charges? Download Sanctioned today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. When the doctor on call showed me the CT scan and I saw the fragments, I saw the hole in his skull, and I saw the pool of blood in his brain, you freak out as a parent. A teen skier seriously injured on Grouse Mountain. His parents and police appeal for anyone with information to come forward. The search for this man who police say could be a key witness. He's actually in the background there. You should see him come out of the car. Uh, witness in a crash in a, that killed a 13-year-old girl in Coquitlam. Mounties say the driver of the white Toyota SUV uh, is not in any trouble but could help in the investigation. A full renewal of the Canadian Coast Guard fleet and creating new shipbuilding jobs right here in British Columbia. In ship shape at Vancouver shipyards, the Trudeau government pledging to spend billions to shore up a rusting fleet. 
And along with the announcement of new ships was the plan to open up the country's shipbuilding strategy to deliver much needed vessels. A strategy was meant to take politics out of these major procurement projects. But as David Cochran explains, there was something about today's announcements that caught the eye. Justin Trudeau made the big announcement in Vancouver where 16 ships will be built in local yards. Canada has the world's longest coastline and Canadians know it's absolutely essential that we protect it. Bernadette Jordan made an echo announcement in Nova Scotia where two Last ships year, will be built. This means more jobs, more opportunities and more economic development for our region. It's billions of dollars and thousands of jobs, a jolt for the Coast Guard, a jolt for the Liberals in key cities in the upcoming election. Halifax and Vancouver are the pillars of Canada's national shipbuilding strategy, the government's go-to yards for large ships. But these ships and future Coast Guard needs will be more than they can handle, so expansion is needed. So we're also starting a competitive process for a third yard. The government insists it's an open competition. So how does it explain this? I'm very confident with my colleague, my colleague Joël Leibon, that the DV will be able to obtain this statute of the third partner. Quebec's Davy shipyard wasn't part of today's announcements, but Quebec Cabinet Minister Jean-Yves Duclos had a news conference anyway, in front of a Coast Guard ship with Coast Guard personnel to promote Davy as that third yard. À titre de député de Québec et du Québec, je peux vous dire que j'ai confiance de voir la Davy relever ce nouveau défi au la main. La Davy est extrêmement bien positionnée pour devenir ce troisième partenaire dans le cadre de la stratégie nationale de construction navale. It was a government organized news conference involving Coast Guard employees to promote the ambitions of a private company to win a government contract. But the Prime Minister's office says Duclos did nothing wrong because he didn't say Davy would be the third shipyard, simply that it should be. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. At 6.36, a live look at uh, well, the area where near some of those ships are going to probably be built on a gorgeous, gorgeous Wednesday night. Is the nice weather going to continue? Brett's going to have the forecast coming up next. Calling all artists. 
who are looking for original art submissions from across BC for a first ever Art on Stage contest. Head to cbc.ca slash art on stage for the full contest details. Two landslides this month have changed the face of Joffrey Peak. Mm -hmm. And a third is likely to happen. Yeah, photos and video taken of the peak show a new crack. And a geologist CBC News spoke to says that means more rock is likely to fall. Drew Brayshaw says it's hard to tell when another slide will happen, but that there's definitely been a loss of stability. BC Parks has closed some areas around Joffrey Peak. There is some good news here. Joffrey Lakes Provincial Park wasn't affected, and it does remain open. Which is good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is some good news. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't been up there yet myself, but I hope to in the very near future. Yeah. Looks yeah. lovely. I haven't oh. either. Yeah. Well, maybe you should do an outing. That would be kind of fun. <laughs> a little team outing. You're right. I love it. Awesome. All right. Well, it is the middle of the week. I couldn't say that the weekend is almost here, but it was a really nice day, I think. And if you beautiful. like the way that it was today, you're going to love what tomorrow has in store. So let's take a quick look back at the day that was. It's actually a pretty dynamic day because we had this beautiful sunrise. These clouds seemingly came out of nowhere for a little while. And then after that, more sunshine lasting all the way throughout the day. And it was fantastic. Temperatures in and around the lower mainland were around 20 degrees. Lots of sunshine expected. And the best part is, these conditions are just going to keep going. Look at this. Tomorrow's forecast all around the south coast of BC. You're going to be dealing with lots of sunshine. Temperatures into the mid-20s for parts of the Fraser Valley. That's you guys in Abbotsford. Over toward Hope. Haven't put this icon in place, but there actually is the risk for a thunder shower there. Meanwhile, one of the coolest parts is going to be Tofino. Not getting up to 20, but still, no rain to be complaining about. A little bit closer to home, if you're in downtown Vancouver, temperatures right around that 20 degree mark. Burnaby, New West, Surrey, 23, and Port Moody, Port Co Coquitlam, that is, right around that 23 mark as well. So, going to be feeling mighty summery, and this is great. Now, of course, with every good thing comes with the bad thing. We have to balance out the fact that there is going to be some rain, but of course, we need to have this rain to keep everything in check. Thursday, overnight into Friday, this is what I've got my eyes on for the south coast of BC in general. Showers expected throughout that time, not going to be really significant, but this is the new development. This is looking at potentially some rain now for Saturday morning. And I say new because all the forecast models for the past few days haven't been hinting at this, so this is not set in stone. But if we see any showers, that's going to be more so into the morning hours before it eventually starts to clear up through the afternoon into the evening. The overall totals here that we're going to be dealing with in that time, these are not crazy amounts. We're dealing with anywhere about 10 millimeters for Vancouver and maybe in and around that 20 millimeter mark for anywhere east towards Abbotsford and Chilliwack. And again, we need this rain. It's going to be good to balance some things out. In addition to that, our five day forecast, you're just going to notice a couple of things here. First and foremost, Friday, that slightly rainy day. As I mentioned, few showers expected, probably lasting until Saturday. But Sunday, I want to draw your attention to that. Right now it says 23 degrees, but I'll let you in on a little secret here. It could actually even be warmer than that. We could be dealing with temperatures into the mid 20s, and that's probably going to be continuing into the start of early next week wow. so if you enjoy some of those warmer temperatures i mean you've got a lot to look forward to into the near future i do enjoy some sunshine and heat who does wow right? see me too yeah it'll be very mm -hmm. good <laughs> all right so we're getting to a story now brett you don't know this but i love yeah. birds so okay. anytime we have a bird story i get very excited well exciting this one is about an owl all a great right. horned owl that got a new lease on life today in Kelowna. The owl's name is Eve, and she was released back into the wild after spending a few months at a rehabilitation center. Yeah, Eve was discovered being attacked by crows in a nearby backyard in February. She was so dehydrated and starving she couldn't fight back, but now she's doing a lot better, as you can see, and the staff at the rehab center have high hopes for her future. We got her just before mating season, um, and so she missed mating season, but her mate waits around for one full year. So this is why we released her in the spot she was found or very close to it so she could possibly find her mate again. Very, very healthy, strong bird and I'm very proud of her. And so there should be. The rehab center that nursed Eve back to health receives more than 150 injured and orphan birds every year. They do good work. I'm not sure many mates would wait around for a year, but <laughs> oh, probably not. he's a lucky gal. <laughs> for sure. <All> right. <laughs> Another day, another Brexit deal rejected. And the plot to get rid of Theresa May, that's coming up.
Thursday on the early edition, we'll bring you episode two of our series, Matheson. Anyone who has lived in Surrey will tell you the city can often be stereotyped unfairly, and that reputation has a major impact on young people. That story tomorrow on the early edition. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. We sent a journalist to a Surrey high school for a month to see what life is like for teenagers today. Don't miss Matheson, a CBC Vancouver special series. Tune in on the early edition, CBC Vancouver News and online. And calling all artists, we're looking for original art submissions from across BC for our first ever Art on Stage contest. For more, head to cbc.ca slash artonstage online. Twelve people were hurt when a car crashed into a building in downtown Quebec City today. None of the injuries are said to be life-threatening. Witnesses say two cars collided in front of an office building and one of the vehicles rammed through a window ending up inside a cafeteria and then catching fire. The whole building had to be evacuated, but the flames were quickly put out. Canada's top soldier acknowledging the hurt feelings of fallen soldiers' families today who say they were left out of a private dedication ceremony for the Kandahar Memorial in Ottawa. Jonathan Vance says no disrespect was intended and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about it today. We are working with DND to uh, make sure we understand what that decision they took was around the Cenotaph and ensure uh, that it is a, a monument that will be uh, there for everyone uh, who wants to remember and celebrate uh, those veterans. Neither the Prime Minister nor the Chief of the Defence Staff apologized to the families and neither is commenting to making the monument public. The Kandahar Cenotaph was dedicated last week behind closed doors. Pictures of the service were posted later on on social media. Efforts to deal with sexual misconduct in the military are still coming up short, according to new numbers from Statistics Canada. 1,200 personnel reported being victimized in the past year, a small decrease from a similar report a couple of years earlier. We are particularly troubled by the persistence of sexual assault which causes the most harm to individuals and to our institution. 
As well, 70% serving in both the regular military and the reserve say they'd seen, heard, or experienced inappropriate sexual or discriminatory behaviors, including remarks, inappropriate physical contact, and indecent exposure. Fewer than half took action. Most of the victims were women. Canadian Armed Forces launched Operation Honor back in 2015 to respond to sexual misconduct in the military, bringing in programs to combat inappropriate behavior, help victims, and encourage reporting. With another deadline to leave the EU in the fall, British Prime Minister Theresa May has asked Parliament to support another version of her scorned Brexit deal. But MPs from both parties rejected it, and as Thomas Daigler reports, promptly plotted yet again how to get rid of their beleaguered Prime Minister. Is it time to go, Prime Minister? Heading to work in the morning or leaving Downing Street for good. Theresa May now under more pressure than ever to quit. Statement, the Prime Minister. But she's still selling her revised Brexit plan as what's best for Britain. Reject it, and all we have before us is division and deadlock. The government benches rather empty for such an important debate. My goodness, talk about ignoring reality. Prime Minister, look at the benches behind you. An indication to the opposition that the Prime Minister has fully lost her grip on power. Her demise was accelerated when she reached out to anti-Brexit MPs by opening the door to a second referendum. I recognize the genuine and sincere strength of feeling across the House on this important issue. That led to closed door Tory meetings today on how best to oust her and public calls to step aside from previously faithful allies. I think we need a new leader and it's, it's really sad. We've only got a few months left until the deadline of the 31st of October and we need a new leader and a new team to be able to deliver that. But who could that be? Leadership contenders stayed conspicuously silent. Well, I'm looking very carefully at the legislation today as leader of the Commons. That's my job, and making sure that it delivers Brexit. Thanks very much. Hours later, Andrea Leadsom kissed May's cabinet goodbye, fed up with the Prime Minister's unpopular Brexit plan. May still plans to lead her Conservatives into tomorrow's European Parliament elections. A disastrous result is expected and could mean she's forced out of Downing Street within days. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Meanwhile, the political divisions in Washington, D.C. are getting even deeper today. President Donald Trump abruptly walked out of a Democratic leaders meeting, saying he won't work with them as long as they're investigating him. But the scrutiny may get worse. As Ellen Morrow tells us, pressure is mounting for a possible impeachment effort. A day of possible bipartisanship descended into yet more animosity. Instead of walking in happily into a meeting, I walk in to look at people that had just said that I was doing a cover-up. I don't do cover-ups. President Trump stormed out on Democratic leaders, set off by earlier comments by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. We believe that the President of the United States is engaged in a cover-up. The sign on the podium, it says what? no collusion, no obstruction. And President Trump's do. feelings on working with the you Democrats? You can't do it under these circumstances. So get these phony investigations over with. That's not going to happen anytime soon. What was once a few Democratic voices calling for Trump's impeachment is slowly turning into a chorus. So we need to uphold the rule of law. It's a question of when, not if. I think the case gets stronger the more they stonewall the Congress. Yesterday, President Trump blocked former White House counsel Don McGahn from testifying to the House Judiciary Committee. The Democrats see McGahn as a potential star witness on whether the president committed obstruction of justice. So far, Pelosi has been reluctant to use the I word. Today, that changed. This president is obstructing justice and he's engaged in a cover-up. And that could be an impeachable offense. Half the American public says, look, the Congress should not hold the impeachment hearings. But this Democratic pollster is urging caution. He says the country isn't there, not yet. I would tell him to move prudently. Don't jump into it, but continue to follow the trail of what's there. 
The quandary for Democrats is whether pursuing impeachment will help them in 2020 or will it hurt them by just doing more to galvanize the president's supporters. The calculations, as always, will be political. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Still to come tonight, iceberg tower tourism helps heat up Newfoundland's economy. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mung, what do you have to say to the charges? I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of a new CBC Vancouver original podcast. This is Sanction, the arrest of a telecom giant. It's the complicated story of how and why Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested. Download Sanction today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, it is iceberg season off of Newfoundland's coast, and it's quite the season at that. Yes, there seem to be twice as many of the icy towers as normally seen this time of year. And as the CBC's Peter Cowan reports, that's good news for the local economy. These icebergs here in Bonavista have been putting on a show. In fact, just a couple of minutes ago, one of them actually cracked apart. Part of it broke off, which had everyone grabbing their cameras to check it out and watch all the ice drift apart. But as impressive as these are on land, they're even better up close from the water. Often in pictures, you don't really get that same sense of just how awe-inspiring and big they are. Grace Capistanic and her family traveled all the way from Vancouver. They're out in a Zodiac bobbing just off Bonavista. Bob Curry is the captain. He used to fly out to Alberta for work, but three years ago, he started his own tour company at home. Icebergs are very important here now, <laughs> especially this time of year. Before the whales and stuff get here, right, you get, get a few icebergs, and, well, people come from all over the world looking for them, and they keep you going until the whales get here. The bevy of bergs means Curry started his trips a month early this year. Curry isn't the only entrepreneur in town who relies on icebergs. Roger Dooling is mixing up a fresh batch of shampoo at his shop on Main Street. East Coast Glow uses iceberg water in 80% of its products. He insists iceberg water makes better soap and gets people in the shop. 
they look at the icebergs, they come to our store and they, and then they're like, wow, they, maybe they didn't know that it was made with iceberg water. But now when they're in the store, we talk and we, and we tell our story. Lots of people have been wondering what's caused this wonderful year for icebergs. Is it climate change? Well, actually, it's more about the winds. These northerly winds have been bringing bad weather, but they've pushed these icebergs on shore. You can also thank a year with lots of sea ice. It protects those icebergs so they don't melt and break apart on their long journey down from Greenland. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Bonavista. All right, that is incredible. I bet lots of uh, people from BC going to check that out. I would love to do that. Yeah. And Brett's here as the expert on this. Yes. If one was to um perhaps chip off a little chunk of the, the yeah the iceberg tar mm -hmm. maybe bring along a little single malt maybe would put it, it into a I nice little so. the purist would say no you can't put any I, ice in you that you can't I know, it's an eye dro or drop of water, water. We dram and but then that I, would yeah. be some of the purest freshest water that, like straight from greenland it basically made its way i mean i would have to enjoy that use That'd it as really cool. drink your scotch and then drink the water after oh, from the ice a little chaser yeah. fine yeah. thank you for your expert <laughs> advice <laughs> I am the Scotch connoisseur. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan is here at 11 o'clock with your next local news. Yeah, and uh, have some goats. Oh, They're really? jumping yeah, in the goats. I forgot about the goats. This is going to brighten your day. It brightened mine. It's awesome. Check this out. Thanks, Brett. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs>